Hello. So today's topic is about uh, oversampling, aliasing, and uh, things of that nature. Now, <laughs> you might be wondering why I'm smiling or laughing. Uh, I am finding it amusing that uh, these are brand new terms which are being thrown out there and people are just, uh, you know, trying to understand. And sometimes they get intimidated that, you know, oh wow, we don't know uh, whether to oversample or not, what is it exactly, and things like that. And, uh, you know, it can become confusing for some people, especially if you're not uh, running a supercomputer with a very super CPU, it's difficult to uh, run many plugins in oversampling mode if they offer such a, you know, option. Many of our plugins also offer oversampling. Is it something I recommend all the time? No. <laughs> um, I, again, this is my opinion and all opinions are welcome. I feel that if I can hear it or in some way it makes me feel that I'm doing something better or adding better quality, whether I can hear it or not, but makes me feel good, it's justified. Go for it. It's go. Um, but in the real nature of things, let me explain to you that, um, see, aliasing and all of that, you know, there are folks who come out with graphs and plugins which depict certain visual, uh, you know, analyzers and things which, which are showing that there's some kind of folding back of harmonics happening in the audible range, which was being processed outside of the audible range because of the Nyquist theorem and certain uh, audio physics. Um, now, what happens is that many of such effects sometimes become more uh, evident when used multiple times or say you have multiple plugins uh, which are using things like saturation and all where various amount of harmonics are being generated and folded back into the audio hearable space. And sometimes it's audible, yes. Um, is it always necessary to get rid of that? That is a, you know, questionable thing. Like for example, the SP1200 sampler. That's full of bad sample rate and like a very low sample rate and a low bit rate and tremendous amounts of aliasing. Uh, for some, it's a piece worth paying $6,000 for. <laughs> but actually what was happening was that was technology pushing itself and breaking down and it kind of had its own beauty. So in that aspect, it works. Now, certain manufacturers claim that, you know, their plugins oversample only some portions or stages of the processing. Hence, uh, not trying to tax the CPU so much, only say going for the saturation part, etc. Oversampling when applied to things like compression will change the attack characteristics of the material naturally because now there are more samples to play with and the envelope will shift, it will change. So the minute you switch on oversampling, if it's working correctly and if it's working on compression also, if intended, you will hear that your compressor is now sounding different also. Suddenly it's not grabbing the peaks that it was grabbing before and things like that will happen. So it all boils down to what? I think it all boils down to the ear, right? Because then again, you will be making readjustments to make sure that the compression is happening the way you want it to happen. So I say you take all of this information and these graphs and all of that with a, with a pinch of salt. You know, you take it to a point where if it's audible, again, in my opinion, then by all means switch on that 2x, 4x and 8x if you can hear the difference. And if you can't, I suggest you just carry on mixing because there might be some saturation or processes that you use very subtly. And if you're using those plugins very subtly, there might not be so many harmonics generated. And if you can not tell the difference cumulatively or in a singular way, then I suggest, you know, avoid oversampling. Let your CPU breathe, <laughs> let your music breathe and go with it. Uh, this is again just my opinion because I see a lot of emphasis has started going on to uh, these things. It's like, you know, analyze the analyzers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, certainly I've never seen any mix engineer sit at the mixing desk or his computer or DAW and first analyze his plugins <laughs> as to what they're doing per session or whatever and then determine, okay, this is not happening or this is happening. Similar to how people recorded on tape. Tape did things to the sound. It's not an exact reproduction of what was going in. But in time, people saw the beauty worked around it. If there was a dulling of the sound, they used a post equalizer. So there's a push-pull process happening. And I think personally that it's that push-pull process which makes things beautiful. 
you know, create an EQ, you know, bump and then negate it with another EQ, compress hard and then go easy on something else. So it's, it's a combination of these things which were happening uh, earlier with the engineers, but it was about feel and it was a lot about intuitive way of approaching music rather than an analytical way. So again, this is just my opinion. I am not, by no means uh, saying that my method is the only method to work. But this is just a video for those who worry about it or probably like, you know, they don't have the CPU power and they are uh, questioning where to use oversampling, where not to use it. So this is just an angle and approach and just a uh, opinion that I have as a developer because, you know, just because you have a feature doesn't mean that it has to be used everywhere or stop you from your creativity. So eventually that's where the point is, you know. You could have a tool which works great. It doesn't matter who made it, where it came from. If you liked its GUI for some reason and that made you mix better, it's totally fine. Who says that's a wrong thing? I think it's perfectly fine. Anything that inspires you is great. Um, and like Bruce Sudin said that I'm more interested in the musical aspect of things than the technical aspect. That's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, who would be more valid than, uh, you know, him? He's done, you know, so many records with Michael Jackson, which still sound pristine and they sound unbeatable, like, you know, really trying to get that sound. So if he felt as a technical person, as a mixing engineer, as a tracking engineer, that he focuses more on the musical aspect than the technical aspect of things. I think what he's trying to say is that uh, beyond a certain point, it's all about the music. It's really about, uh, you know, musicality and how you hear. Then it is about what gear you used and, you know, how you used it. So there are different gears for different people. There are different tastes that people have and uh, different approaches. So no one method is right, I suppose. Uh, this is just an opinion and just uh, an encouragement video, I would say, for those who worry too much about things like aliasing and all. I say, if you hear it and affects you, by all means, change it or use oversampling. If not, just mix. Just use what you have, uh, even if it's stock plugins, it's fine. If you've got the idea, if you've got the inspiration, that overpowers mediums and limitations of mediums. So go for it. That's just my two cents again. Thank you very much. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, is this uh, a good idea that I put out there or do you strongly disagree with me? I'd love to learn too, you know, maybe uh, I can get some information which helps me grow. So I'm always open to that. Please comment if you could. Uh, I would uh, really appreciate it. Thank you again. And I'll see you in another video. Ciao.